Code 3. A live podcast sponsored by the Marin Fire History Group. All about the history of the fire service in Marin County, California. And now your host, retired fire chief, Paul Smith. Good afternoon and welcome to the Marin County Fire History website. This afternoon, we have with us two guests, retired fire chief Jeff Davidson from the Mill Valley Fire Department. Thank you, Jeff, for joining us today. And we have Mark Brown, the deputy chief of the Marin County Fire Department. Uh, and and we're, today's topic is going to be the COVID pandemic and uh, managing that at the operations level and at the emergency command center. So Jeff has got um, currently on the North Bay incident management team. And Mark Brown is here as uh, boots on the ground, current fire chief working on uh, the, the, the current situation. And Jeff, if you would please start out with a little overview of the North Bay incident management team and how this uh, COVID-19 pandemic is being handled uh, at that level. Sure. Well, if it's all right, what I'd like to do is turn it over to our founding member and incident commander, Chief Brown, to talk a little bit about the North Bay Incident Management Team, and then we can talk a little bit more specifically about the team's interaction and support uh, of the county response to that. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, so back in 2012, um, incident management teams really started to consider that they needed to um, have a bigger footprint than just wildland fires or fire related incidents and um, that all hazards types incidents needed to be managed by incident management teams. In fact, Marin had um, um, a, a law enforcement event at the extended stay in Santa Fe where a SWAT team had to uh, stay engaged for over 24 hours. And um, it was real difficult for the law enforcement agencies to support uh, their officers for 24 hours. And so an all hazards incident management team that can respond to both fire and law made a lot of sense. So myself, uh, Dave Jeffries, when he was working with uh, Novato PD at the time, and Doug Pittman went to the Marin County Fire Chiefs and Marin County Police Chiefs with the proposal to create the Marin County Incident Management Team, an all hazards type three incident management team. And um, shortly after that, there was an urban area strategic initiative um, meeting of the North Bay, and we talked about making the Marin Incident Management Team, and the North Bay counties were like, wow, we'd really like to get involved. And we were looking at our pool of people that we had, and we really didn't have enough people within Marin to staff the team adequately, and partnering with the rest of the North Bay counties made a lot of sense. Yeah, and so you see that it, it covers the, um, all of the North Bay, and um, we have a partnership with Cal Fire, um, Snow Lake Napa, and quite frankly, that's where a lot of our responses have um, involved. Uh, the incident management team has been engaged in virtually all of the large-scale fires that have occurred in Sonoma County since 2013, um, giving the team just a tremendous amount of experience. Um, but that experience hasn't just been fighting the fire. There's been a couple um, EOC deployments surrounding the different fires, uh, supporting shelters um, that were activated because of the fires. Um, and then all of that led to being able to prepare our people to work in the EOC come uh, the COVID uh, challenges. So you can see we have a pretty comprehensive list of people, of agencies that are supporting the team. And um, it's not just fire. And it's not just people that are currently working. And um, when we have a, a pandemic type response, having people from public health as part of the team, having in, in, in the middle of fire season when all the firefighters are on strike teams or our other overhead assignments, if it weren't for the retirees on our team, Jeff nodding his head over there, um, we wouldn't be able to respond at all. So having the retirees has uh, allowed these guys to continue to stay engaged in something they love, and it's given us depth that we wouldn't normally have. And then um, how about the list of the activations that we've had, Jeff? And you'll be able to see the, the broad range of activations that we've had. 
and did they really, you know, go through all hazards from pandemic response, supporting shelters, um, even um, just going to San Quentin when, when um, Occupy San Quentin happened. But, um, or um, we even had one where um, uh, there was a demonstration because of the San Francisco Teachers Union's um, um, uh, contract negotiations and they were expecting civil unrest. So it's, it's, it's been challenging. Um, when we go to an incident management team goes to a fire or firefighters go to a fire, we know what to do. Um, we put the fire out and we have lots of different ways to put the fire out. It's when you get to these all hazards incidents, sometimes it's a lot more difficult. And, and um, the first thing we have to ask ourselves is actually identify what the problem is. And sometimes that's the hardest part. Um, and then firefighters and incident management team members being problem solvers, once we identify the problem, then we can get some traction to solve the problem. I'll also add on uh, this, you'll notice um, if you, use your memory banks and think back over the last four or five years, pretty much every large fire that's occurred in the Sonoma Lake Cal Fire unit or in that northern area uh, is listed on here because our team has become almost an initial attack resource for Cal Fire. And a lot of the fires you'll notice in the column to the right transition to a type one team, which is a larger team with more uh, ability for uh, managing the more complex or um, larger incidents, but we typically stay embedded with the CAL FIRE teams and our personnel get experience with uh, operating in a, a type one team environment. But you can see um, pretty much every large fire that's been in the news lately, Kincaid, Henthorne, Camp, um, Mendocino Complex, Pawnee, Tubbs, uh, our team has been on the ground uh, in the first 24 hours of most of these incidents and has gained a lot of experience with um, being able to um, respond to these and also work with uh, CAL FIRE's type one personnel. Well, Jeff, and also um, the, the activations have actually extended well beyond the North Bay. Uh, two or three assignments in, in Mendocino, the Mendocino complex, the North Bay IMT was yep. there before the CAL FIRE team came in. Um, two deployments to Santa Cruz, I think, and then the assignment for the campfire wasn't on the fire. It was to support the EOC in the town of Paradise. Yeah. One of the interesting and, and nice components of our team is it is a multidiscipline team. It's not just all fire or just law enforcement. We have a a mix of people and we bring to that um, a tempo and a depth that uh, a single um, focused discipline team may not have. And uh, going back to uh, the EOC deployment here um, relative to the Nuns and Tubbs fire in 2017, the former assistant city manager of Novato was, um, had moved over to the town of Sonoma as their city manager and put a call in to Novato Fire and the people she used to work with and said, hey, our people are starting to get tapped out here. Is there any chance you could send a few people up to help us in the EOC? And he said, no, we're kind of tapped out too, supporting the fire, but maybe the IMT would be helpful. And uh, our on-call IC that week was Dave Jeffries, retired Novato police captain, who is a certified emergency manager. Uh, myself, who, when I was uh, with the city of Mill Valley, oversaw emergency management programs. So we were able to put a, what originally might be thought of as a fire-based team into an EOC and help train and mentor and support those local government um, and municipal government personnel to, um, mm -hmm. to get their EOC um, in a functional and forward-leaning momentum. And then that transitions into um, the town of Paradise and, hey, we could use some EOC support up here. And uh, we had a uh, drill, I think it was last year, Mark, with um, our team and Marin County EMS and Health and Human Services. And it was not a pandemic exercise, but it was a medical um, event. And when this opportunity came to deploy and support, we already had some traction on the ground with the Marin County EOC with people in the room 
who were responsible for coordinating and managing the response. So we didn't have to be handing out business cards during the emergency. We were able to um, you know, have some of that done ahead of time. So it was a fairly seamless transition to bring us in to help support the current EOC operation. So um, Jeff, if I can jump in here for a minute, it sounds to me like <clears throat> you have a, a good blend of really experienced um, emergency managers. Some of those are retirees. Some of those are current folks that are dealing in this particular uh, uh, pandemic, they're dealing on the regular job and they're also uh, assisting the details of the OIC. When we move forward in, in staffing um, this particular incident up, how did, how did you get a hold of um, those folks and were they chosen because of their experience? And the, what I'm trying to say here is, um, Mark mentioned that this protocol started in like 2014. So you folks have had a number of incidents, a number of calls, a number of call outs, and I'm not talking about two or three day incidents. These are week long incidences. And I can tell that you've gained a ton of experience for your team moving forward. Now, what were some of the challenges when this COVID pandemic came together? How did you identify, uh, um, like Chief Brown said, you have to identify the problem. Now, what are a couple of the, of the problems that you initially were able to identify with your um, multidiscipline team? Mark, you want that or you want me to start? Our way, you, you were there at the DOC. So um, Chief Brown reached out to myself and retired Fire Chief Jim Irving, and we are both plan section chiefs on the team. And he said, would you guys be available to assist the Marin EOC in the planning section? Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were both immediately um, offered up to um, Chris Riley and his team in the EOC. And Jim and I, I think starting on March 8th or 9th, uh, began uh, working as plan section chiefs, but immediately paired up with staff from the county who had been identified um, in the plan section and began a collaborative mentoring process. And I think what we bring to the table, um, regardless of the type of event that we're dealing with, is a system. We bring ICS, we bring the planning key and the planning process. So we kind of do an environmental scan and we see that there's a lot of great people doing incredible work, but sometimes it's um, redundant or sometimes it's stovepipe. So you begin to um, start to a little bit of bump and nudge management to get into a, a regular battle rhythm, if you will, to establish goals and objectives to document what you're doing and whether it's in the EOC or out in the field, the processes from the plan section are very, very similar. Um, I'll go back to what I said a little earlier that the exercise that we did last year, I believe it was, with Health and Human Services and EMS allowed us to be able to look across the room and go, I know you, we've worked together, we trained together, oh yeah. And then uh, twice during the last year, during uh, power safety shutoffs, our team was activated and put on standby. And a couple of days we posted up at the EOC. So again, we had the ability to um, sit with, partner, and mentor some of those staff. So what we bring to the table is system. And we also bring the background of emergency management, where as we all know in a typical EOC, it's local government. It's someone from planning or building or general services. And they're subject matter experts and very technically competent at what they do, but sometimes putting that into an organizational structure that um, looks slightly different than their day-to-day -day org chart or system um, and gets them so not every group is doing their own logistics, but there's logistical people to manage the overall logistical response. Um, but I'll tell you, we do have a challenge as, a, as firefighters because we tend to run things out in the field and we have to remind ourselves that in the EOC, we're in a coordinating role. We're not telling them where to put the shovel. We're helping them 
strategize as to all the information about where the shovels should be going and make sure they have enough shovels and help them with some prioritization, but we're not running the field. So we have to remind ourselves to step back sometimes and remember that we're up here helping them coordinate, not down here managing the day to day and um, using the same systems and processes uh, that we establish out in the field um, help us to stay focused. And, and just as a little sidebar, um, when we were up at the Paradise Town EOC um, as, a, as a result of the campfire, um, we came in about three days into the event and the majority of the city staff was operating in the EOC and there was a couple of mutual aid um, EOC people there, one from San Francisco and I think one from San Mateo. And they were rotating out as we were coming in. And the guy pulled me aside and said, just remember, they don't need ICS right now as much as they need a little bit of compassion. Yeah. And so helping remember that um, we can be very tactical and very hierarchical. Um, in our fire ground operations, but in the EOC sometimes um, a little bit of empathy and a little bit of understanding uh, for some of the bigger picture stuff, especially when the people in the room are being affected as community members is super, super important. It's a I, was, I was going to mention just how different this was also because, you know, you as a fire chief, Jim Irving and firefighters in general, they're used to being in charge, in command. And whenever, normally when we train in the EOC environment, it is some type of fire-related or law-related incident where law and fire are the lead. Well, this is a public health emergency, and law and fire are, are subordinate to public health. And um, so the medical health op area coordinator, the MOAC, was primarily the lead within, within the EOC. And then um, the planning, and just remember, it's not just the planning section, it's the planning and intelligence section. Right. And that took on a whole new th um, realm for you guys, bringing in all the health and human services members to do the contact tracing, following any identified positive tests, which is a super labor intensive um, um, endeavor. And then um, the MOAC helping to guide through uh, research and through the guidance of CDC on how our firefighters and firefighter paramedics need to respond out to the field and that connection within the EOC with Dr. Ballard from EMS um, pushing out those guidelines and then we never whenever we exercise these types of, of events never did we think that personal protective equipment was going to be our linchpin and right. um, having to uh, set up whole new ordering systems um, and plan on those ordering systems and supply trains to fail. And so that just brought in a whole new dynamic into the situation. Well, and also if we're at a incident command post for a fire and you can tell who's been on the line sometimes because they may smell like smoke or they may say, don't get near me. I got poison oak on my turnouts. But when you're in, an EOC or a fire station and someone is non-symptomatic and possibly carrying um, a COVID-19 positive status, it can be a silent killer. A huge element with the uh, isolation and separation. And you know, we did have uh, a large number of people working in the EOC early on and um, positive tests started to, to crop up. People working or that had been in the EOC were testing positive and had started self-isolating. And then, um, you know, pretty soon everybody that could was remotely operating from home or some remote site so they could support the EOC operation, but not be in a physical space to potentially get infected or carry it. Um, because the lot is wipe out your subject matter experts that are trying to respond to this. Right, and on that point, Jeff, um, we all train in hazardous materials. When we're in the field, you have uh, the field folks doing the hazardous material mitigation and decontamination. But never would those folks wind up inside the EOC prior to decontaminate. That's your point. Yeah. We, can, we know how to decon. We know how to work with hazardous materials. But with this uh, silent, uh, invisible um, um, virus, 
you're absolutely right. It can get transmitted from one person to another, but you were never, if you would, comparing it to the hazardous material incident, you were never on the scene. The scene in this case, we'll go back to your map you showed um, you know, earlier. The scene is, you know, nine counties. That's your scene. That's your ma that's your management scene. And, and how it, it's amazing to me how the dynamics of that work at that sort of a level. Um, and Chief Brown touched on it briefly uh, with the first responders. Now, our first responders are coming to shift every day, and I'm talking about law enforcement, you know, um, uh, medical staff, and and fire, of course. Um, but how do you see those folks, uh, Mark, with regard to their day-to-day -day response? How has that changed since COVID-19? Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's so different than what you would have ever imagined before. Um, and I think uh, uh, Marin being an all-fire-based EMS has actually yeah. really helped us quite a bit. Um, because we already had really good uh, pre-existing relationships with EMS. And um, Dr. Ballard with EMS was the one that was really putting the, um, the most work and guidance into the personal protective or PPE equipment that our folks needed to wear, how we needed to approach different calls. He was researching, studying, reaching out to other uh, physicians, not just throughout the United States, but throughout the world, talking to the physicians in China, talking to physicians in Italy, and getting the best information for our guys. And then he would work through the fire rescue branch and push that information out. And it wasn't just the PPE, it was part of the approach to a patient. You know, when we go to a medical aid, we're used to uh, the people on the engine company and the uh, ambulance all just going right into the house and treating the patient. And it had to be, it started getting to the point where we would put one person in a PPE and have them approach and then get into the scene, evaluate the scene. And then, um, you know, Chief Weber has been saying, you know, our guys are great on fires because they can see the smoke, they can see the fire. As Jeff talked about, you can't see any of this. And so um, it, we started having to really pull our guys back and have them take one step at a time. Um, and that morphed into um, uh, different 911 call answering protocols where mm -hmm. the comm center, when you're on the phone with the, the caller, having to pre screen for COVID related questions. And then those questions had to change the deeper that we got into the incident. You know, the first batch of questions had to do with travel. Then once it started becoming community spread, then the travel questions went away and it went into more symptom based questions. And then we're now at the point where we're asking people to be masked before we go into a house. And if they're mobile, we're asking that they either come to the door that we're going to come get them from or um, actually step outside. And it's, 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 it's twofold. It's not just to protect our responders. It's also to protect the other people that are within that building or residence, um, skilled nursing facility or whatever. So there's not the cross contamination. So, um, it's, it was a, a big change. And then, um, you guys are probably going to talk a lot of this, but since when did you ever think that you would hear firefighters complain about not having enough paper gowns to wear? <laughs> and the paper gowns is, is, is actually turned into a vital tool because the COVID can be on your, your, your clothing, you touch your clothing and you touch your face and there you go. And so, um, and, and the paper gowns have been one of the, the most difficult pieces of PPE that we've um, um, had uh, supply chain issues. Fortunately, we haven't run out of them, but, um, and that's where, again, the relationship that we had with EMS, but then we fell back on the relationships that we had within all the marine fire agencies, is that um, at first, you know, I'm going to talk in March 5th through March 10th or so, you know, agencies are doing a little bit of research and finding out, okay, we could do this and this is better for us. And then it was uh, phone a friend and you're finding out that this agency is doing that. And um, it was kind of trickling to the other agencies. And so um, we, we created a group that we, um, you know, we had to make a new acronym, right? So um, the acronym is FOPOC, but it's Fire Op Area um, Coordination Group. So we got people from every air, geographical area we're in using the EMS uh, zones, 
right. um, and to put together uh, procedures for everybody, uh, ranging from what PPE to wear, where to get the PPE, if the PPE supply chain fails, what are we going to fall back on? And we've actually ordered all that. We have backup um, supply uh, PPE. If the stuff, if the N95 masks and the face shields and the gowns go away, we have backups for those already work in house, and and we'll switch to those if we need to. Um, and another one was how are we going to keep our firefighters? safe and the biggest threat of our firefighters wasn't necessarily going on calls it was at home and someone coming to work as an asymptomatic carrier and going into the fire station so uh, you talk hazmat we set up a cold uh, warm hot zone the cold zone is within the fire station and people need to feel comfortable that they are safe within that fire station the warm is where um, they would get temperature checks um, and wellness checks and take their street clothes off and wear uh, different attire within the station. So anything that was on the clothing wouldn't get into the station. And then the hot zone is the outside world. And, um, and so for as a, one of the chief officers of our organization, we used to be able to go from station to station and see our guys and, and under a stressful situation like this, visible leadership is important and we really can't give it face to face. So we're actually having to do lots of Zoom calls. And so, because um, we, we feel it's important for our, our, our guys to see us. Um, so that's how we tackled that. Um, and then we set up disinfection sites for the ambulances, one site by each hospital. And we hired a contractor that's um, fogging the ambulances. And so that we know that um, if a COVID patient is in the back of the ambulance, that the next person that's in the back of the ambulance um, can be sure that they're getting into a clean environment or that our paramedics that get in there on the next shift aren't contracting COVID from that. Um, so in March, if you would have said, told me two months away in May, you didn't have any firefighters that um, came down positive with COVID, I would have, I would have thought you were crazy. And um, the amazing thing is no firefighters have yet tested positive. And we've We've started testing all of our firefighters, whether they're asymptomatic or symptomatic, and yet to have a single positive test. Now we know it's it'll be crazy to think that that won't happen. So part of that FOPOC group created all the guidelines that if someone is sick, these are the steps that you follow, and this is what you need to do with the fire stations they were at, so that we can make sure that none of the other firefighters at that station get sick. This is what has to happen in order for them to um a return to work this is how we're going to handle time off we set up a, a, a self-isolation and uh, quarantine procedures and we were able to secure hotel rooms and if a person didn't feel comfortable self-isolating at home that we had hotels for them to go to so um but it's all worked yeah it's a huge that's, operation that's that's the rewarding part of it yeah that's a that's a lot of coordination and i my hat's off to you both because to have um zero firefighters wind up getting COVID. That's, that's, a, that's, an, that's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Because a couple of points you made here, Chief, was number one was uh, and a, a firefighter can get contract COVID at work. The other part that I thought was interesting is the firefighter soft duty picks up COVID in the world brings it into the fire station and that's almost a worse scenario because you know he's dragging the virus into work and then all those contacts both at work and the people he was uh, contacts during the day it could be a disaster and I, my hat's off to you for uh, thinking about that beforehand and I had just another quick question out there you mentioned your uh, decontamination decontaminating the um, the uh, rescues, the, the ambulances, post um, um, post patient care, right? Is that now? As I understand it, that's for every single transport, not just somebody that has. Uh, uh, they could be asymptomatic. Still, you uh, decontaminate the rig. We're, we're giving some judgment to the paramedics, but for the most part, it is after every transport. But if it's if they're very very confident that there wasn't a COVID type 
uh, exposure, they're not doing that. Um, but we've also opened it up to law enforcement. So law enforcement can bring the patrol cars. And then uh, most of the agencies are setting up routine uh, trips with fire engines and bringing the equipment that they bring into the homes and getting those disinfected. And then disinfecting the cabs once more in case there was a asymptomatic carrier amongst the firefighters right. so the cab can be disinfected. You know, I'll well, share a personal very, story very... on my level. Go um, ahead, Jeff. It was the a second or third week of March when we were up at the EOC initially before the full team had gotten activated. Uh, it was just a couple of us from the plans section, and there was um, people that had worked in the EOC that tested positive. So, again, we all started to work remotely, and, of course, the very next day I got a dry cough. And... <laughs> I immediately started checking my temperature six, seven times a day and monitoring the cough. Um, being a, um, an employee of Chief Brown as part of the incident management team, I let him know. And at that time, the criteria was if you are not symptomatic, you're not gonna get referred for a test. And Mark was like, if you want a test, we will get you a test, do not hesitate. But I also recognized that it was early on where there was a struggle to get enough test kits and then we had enough test kits, but there was capacity to get them circulated. So I said, I'm gonna do exactly what CDC and the health officer says, I'm gonna lock myself down for 14 days at home. And um, I ended up um, for three weeks checking my temperature, monitoring everything. And for one two hour period, my temperature went above 100 degrees and then went right back down. Mm -hmm. Turns out that the dry cough that didn't go away and linger for quite a while was because I was stuck in the house and we remodeled recently and it's so airtight that there's no moisture in the house. <laughs> so every time I go out back to walk the dog or do a little stretch, my cough got better. But as soon as I went inside, I'm, like, <clears throat> I'm coughing again. Mm -hmm. So it was possibly, you know, related. It was possibly unrelated. But just today, I did get a COVID-19 test because the EOC now has expanded capacity, as Chief Brown indicated, they want all first responders to get tested for baseline. And um, knock on wood, my positive result of that test will be that I'm negative. <laughs> good good, good to hear, that's good to hear. And that's the other piece is, you know, we have coughs and colds and allergy season and everything else upon us. And that's difficult for us to, in this environment, say, well, is it my allergies or exactly. did, I, did I bump up against something in the world? And, um, you know, do I self-isolate right away or do I call my doctor? You know, as a civilian, what do I do? What am I supposed to do? Yep. So um, I appreciate the, um, <laughs> the self-isolation there, there, Jeff, because, that, you know, that's, that's, an important, that's an important piece. You want to make sure you don't spread I'm not wearing the mask because of you. I'm wearing it because of me. Right. Right, and I think, um, I think the media in the last couple of three, four weeks has done a really good job of trying to get the word out there to, uh, to uh, us of us in the world that only go to the grocery store once a week and um, haven't filled my car up with fuel in like six or eight weeks, so <laughs> keep it that way. Now, well, you know, the other interesting piece in this, and this is, you know, kind of a it's a function within the EOC, um, but it's also a larger political debate and decision is, um, you know, there's the concept of the hammer and the dance. And the hammer was, let's close it down fast. Let's isolate, let's shut stuff down. Let's flatten the curve. And now the dance is, how soon do we let that hammer up? And if we do it too soon, then we're gonna have to put the hammer back down again. And if we don't do it soon enough, then we have economic concerns and we have social uh, frustration. Um, and the health officers and the political leaders, it's a big dance right now. And it's kind of like, as a you know former fire marshal, um, I can't remember how many times I had debates with city council members when we were talking about a fire ordinance, you know, upgrading fire sprinklers in residences or the, you know, way back when we just started talking about non-combustible roofs, which was a big deal. And the comment was always, um, well, we really don't have a huge fire problem in Mill Valley. What do you run like six or seven fires a year? So what, what's the purpose of all this? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the counterfactual that is, well, let's not do anything and see what happens. And the fire prevented is the statistic that you can't quote. And here we are with COVID-19. We're flattening the curve, keeping people at home. 
but at some point people are going to start saying, okay, enough is enough. And I know that the, um, the working professionals, the Mark Browns of the world, the, the uh, health officers, they're worried about the fall and what could happen if there's a resurgence of this during the flu season. I'm, I'm really worried about the fall. Um, because I mean, we do need to lift some of these restrictions for a couple of reasons. The, the economy needs it. And um, quite frankly, we need people to start getting sick. Um, we used uh, the flattening of the curve to increase our healthcare capacity, which we have. And Jeff was a big part of that with the ultimate care site that's been established to, for more hospital beds. And in each, all the hospitals have done a great job of increasing the number of beds they have. Um, so it is time to get people sick because if you want to know what's going to happen in the future, look in the past. Look at any pandemic, and it's been two years, and, and it goes through multiple flu seasons. So we're going to stop infecting people during the summer just because I think the science is showing that COVID doesn't like the heat, and so it's not going to transfer very well. Then the fall is going to come around. We're going to hit September, October. Flu season is going to start ramping up. COVID season is going to start ramping up. We're The shelter in places if I were a vet man, are coming back. Mm. And then we're going to get wildland fires, and we're going to st try to start evacuating people that are in a shelter in place. Right. So, so that convergence is not going to be good. And then, um, you know, we're, we can start getting firefighters that are sick, and then that decreases our ability to start sending resources either in county or out of county. And that was part of what the FOPOC did as well, is that, each agency created a drawdown matrix and so that they know um, they're tracking how many people they have that are available to work. They know um, what stations they would start browning out should they have um, um, not enough firefighters. And then we've been working with labor to create a, um, a shared services agreement across all the agencies to be able to share firefighters from one agency to another in order to provide staffing. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, that's I'd like to wrap it up. That this is this is very very educational, and Chief Brown ends on a very good, uh, very strong note there because we don't know what it's going to look like in two months or four months or six months. Because the old joke us all fire chiefs used to always say, all the firefighters used to say, "Well, every fire I ever went to is out," <laughs> and this is a different dynamic. This is a different twist. You know, I, I see the, the analogies between COVID and training in PPE. I see the analogies between um, COVID and, and uh, training your firefighters. I see the analogy between COVID and hazardous material response. And then Jeff's piece with operating an EOC. Well, an EOC is an EOC is an EOC. But this being, brings a different twist to emergency command and control. So um, I'd like to thank everyone very much for their time this afternoon. Uh, very educational, uh, very timely, I believe. And uh, I'd like to say thanks to um, Chief Davidson for his time and for Chief Brown for uh, his expertise and thank you both for what you're doing out there uh, in the world to uh, to keep this thing in a positive uh, try to keep this thing in a, in a positive vein and not go not go to heck in a handbasket so thank you you're welcome happy to participate thank you thank you mm -hmm.